Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Watchman Talk, a series of conversations with Israeli experts and practitioners in the fields of military, security, intelligence, and diplomacy. And our special guest uh, today for a two-part conversation is Ambassador Itzhak uh, Isaac uh, Lebanon, uh, a former Foreign Service uh, officer with a career, a very rich career, which culminated in being the Israeli ambassador to Cairo, Egypt, um, a post uh, which came under a very, very dangerous assault by uh, a mob, but we will get to there. So, Isaac, welcome. Thank you very much, Amir. Thank you for having me here. Now, um, you um, was you were born and uh, you spent your formative years not in Israel, but in a neighboring country. What can you tell us Indeed. about that? Well, I was born in Beirut, uh, Lebanon, um, and I grew up there. I studied there. I had my friend there. Uh, actually, um, you know, until the age of 20, I was in Beirut until the time that we made Aliyah in a very uh, special framework and circumstances. I came to Israel at that age, but until the 20s, I grew up in Lebanon and, you know, I absorbed the atmosphere, the culture, the country. And, and you considered Lebanon your homeland? Uh, of course, Lebanon is a, a country, not uh, perhaps a nation, but it's a country of um, many uh, minorities, Christian of various uh, uh, faiths, um, Shiites, uh, Sunni, Palestinians after 1948. Look, to be, to be candid with you, uh, today, after that I have Lebanon, you know, 50 years ago, the feeling that I have in Lebanon is that I was born there. My country is Israel, definitely. But at that time? Look, at that time, I was a Lebanese. I was born in Lebanon. I grew up in Lebanon. So I was a Lebanese Jew who grew up, you know, in the Jewish uh, quarter called Wadi Abu Jamil. Uh, but today I am fully Israeli and this is my homeland and this is, you know, my country. But still, you know, when you are born in a certain country, you have some kind of... I don't know, nostalgia, something, you know, sentimental, something, you know, that, uh, but definitely I was completely deceived by the behavior of the liberties. If we jump 15 years following your emigration from Lebanon to Israel, we will go back, of course, uh, to certain phases there. But if we go from 1967 to 1982, you are already a foreign service officer. And Israel has invaded Lebanon and has uh, diplomatic contacts with Lebanon, with the Jumail family, uh, whom uh, you knew earlier. And uh, hopefully, if there is indeed a peace treaty between the countries, and if the Syrians let it pass, uh, all of that, of course, uh, is a fantasy, then... Uh, maybe you can serve in the first Israeli embassy in Beirut and become the Israeli ambassador to Beirut. Well, actually, uh, I mean, you are taking me back really uh, into, into the past. I would say even into the deep past. Let's start by the end. Yes, when I was in Israel and everybody was talking that Lebanon will be the second country to make peace with Israel after Egypt, yes. I had a dream to be the first Israeli ambassador because I'm closing a circle. I know Lebanon. I grew up. I am an Israeli, a diplomat. Uh, you know, it fits, let's say, in my mind, in, my, in, in, the, in the mental framework that, yes, I could be the first Israeli uh, ambassador in Lebanon. But everything faded because of the circumstances. Uh, the second thing is, uh, during the first war in Lebanon in 1982, I was already stationed in Paris. And I have been nominated as the main 
contact with all the political figures in Lebanon, which came to Paris from time to time. Yes, of so, course, with friends being... Yes. Uh, so I have been, you know, in touch with all the people, not only the Jumayel, it was Camille Shabon, it was Dani Shabon, it was the Druze, it was everybody. Here we forged, let's say, the contacts with the different political figures and power in, in Lebanon during that war. I'm talking 1982. And don't forget that uh, Israel stayed in Lebanon for 18 years. So I was in Paris in charge of that. So yes, I had the contact. But it was a professional contact. Now, you uh, uh, were born uh, Isaac Cohen or Cohen Kishik, uh, or at least your mother had uh, both uh, names. And when the time came to adopt uh, a more Israeli sounding name, all of, of all names you chose Lebanon, which is Lebanon. My name in Beirut was Isaac, which is the English translation of Isaac in French, not Yitzhak in Hebrew. Nobody called me Yitzhak in Lebanon. They called me O Isaac in French or Isaac uh, in English. When I came to Israel and I joined the foreign service and with my feelings against you know, the state of Lebanon in general, because what they did uh, to me and to my mother, I wanted to change the name, so, but I wanted to stay still linked to something which is part of me because I was born there. So I chose the name Lebanon and incidentally, it was my dear wife who told me, look, Isaac Lebanon phonetically sounds very good and we, I go for that. Now, you mentioned your mother, uh, obviously a very important figure um, in the annals of uh, Israeli intelligence. Uh, and um, she, she lived to be a hundred almost. Almost. And um, was not only very brave, but um, she, on her own volition, she had the initiative to uh, contact, even in pre-state of Israel days, to contact authorities here and, and uh, uh, generate, not only take part, but generate uh, two uh, important efforts. One, to smuggle Jews out of Syria who wanted to go to uh, uh, British mandate uh, time Palestine and to send uh, forward intelligence. What was the story of Shulamit Cohen, Shula Cohen? Incidentally, uh, the day after the war, we are going to celebrate the fifth year of her passing away. Look, in retrospect, uh, going back to Lebanon and as a young child, I was 14 years old. I didn't know so, I mean, that much, but it was the atmosphere, it was the, you know, the things going on within the family which capture my attention and my scrutiny. I wanted now, to know your, things. Your mother was born uh, in Buenos Aires, moved to Jerusalem, and then married a Lebanese Jew. My mother, uh, my mother, uh, the, the, my grandfather and my grandma went, uh, they are both from Jerusalem, they went to Argentina for business. And in one of the trip, my mother was born in Argentina, but they came back uh, as a baby, you know, to Israel. And then she grew up in Jerusalem and she studied in Evelina de Rothschild School. So she is considered as being, let's say, a Jerusalemite in Israeli. And this is the love that they have to this city until the last day of her life. She wanted all the time to go back to Jerusalem. So when she was here and my father was um, a Lebanese um, well-established, let's say, figure in, within the Jewish community there. A merchant, a businessman. He wanted to be married, but he didn't find any, you know, somebody uh, a in, you know, in, a suitable bride in Beirut. So one of the friends in Jerusalem, but he used to come to Jerusalem and say, look, I have somebody for you. And this is how, you know, the contact started. And my mother came to Beirut and both were married in Beirut with a big fan fan, you know, uh, and everybody, everybody was and, and happy. This, this is, uh, according to the custom of the time, a shidduch, matchmaking. Yes. 
It was a, a clear shidduch, but, you know, after so many years, I can say it was a successful shidduch. But he was her senior by, by several years. It doesn't matter. He was careful. He took care of her. He loved her. He, he, he did everything for her. And uh, she also reciprocated. So it was a good shidduch. And she had a lot of time on her hands, but also an interest in Jewish affairs, not only in Beirut, but in Palestine, which was going to be Israel and around it. So how, how did she have this idea? How did she have, have this idea of contacting um, what was to become Mossad at that time? It had Look, an... like, any, like, uh, like everything you know, in the world, things happen you know, incidentally, without any purpose or intention. It was, you know, um, an information which reached my father that there is uh, the Kawukji general, a Lebanese general from the uh, uh, liberation uh, army against, you know, the Israelis. He was preparing to launch a war against the northern part of Israel. We, we, should, we should explain that um, after the November 29th uh, UN resolution, the partition resolution, there was still um, half a year or so, a, a war only between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, they were going to be helped by outside forces from Jordan, uh, Egypt, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and what have you. But until May 15th, it was confined to the borders of so, Israel. So it was close to May 15 that she got this information and she was troubled. She says, look, if they will succeed, they will reach my family, they will kill everybody and, you know... Are in going, Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they will slaughter everybody. So she was troubled and she, she tried to find out how I can send this information to the people, you know, in Israel in order that they will be aware that there are preparation like that. And she sent a letter. And she remembered that during the uh, scout uh, member, they used boy, to boy, write... Girl scouts, boy scouts. Boy scouts and girl scouts, you know, to, to write something, you know, in between the lines, something, you know, with a special... I don't secret know, ink. Secret ink. She sent it to Jerusalem and she signed Shula, Jerusalem. To her cousin. Apparently to her cousin, but it reached its destination. And this is how the whole contact started. First of all, the Israeli side was prepared to this attack. And secondly, they say, look, we have somebody here who is aware of the situation. Probably he can do more than that. And they contact her and she says yes. And that's it. But, you know, it's astounding because the first of all, at that time, there were contacts. Uh, there was a relatively free movement between uh, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and several uh, prominent Israelis were born there, like the Sasson family in Damascus. And uh, obviously the underground here in pre-state Israel sent people to immerse themselves um, in Lebanon as well as in other places. But here there is... It was her initiative. Here there is her someone initiative. who volunteers. Yes, it was her initiative based on the tribal information she received and she was scared to death about the family and the destiny of the state of Israel, which was on its way to be established. Obviously, a unique case yes. uh, in the annals of, uh, yes. of Israeli intelligence. I would say that this is the highest ideal that somebody can reach. Uh, you know, she was a mother of a few children, I think three children. Um, she had everything. Uh, everything sounds and look, you know, that perfect. And suddenly to jump into this, you know, dangerous and the troubled water. But she was convinced that she has to do it for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people. And she did it. Did she have a code name back here? Um, yes. What was that? Pearl. The Pearl. The Pearl. And by the way, the first book, she, she wrote two books. And the first book was the code name, The Pearl. And this was the real code she received. Was she aware of the code or was it only here in the files? I think that at a certain stage or in one of her visits to Israel, somebody mentioned to her that, you know, this is the pearls because she liked very much pearls. Yes. Now, 
you too uh, have written a book. It's here. Yes. Um, uh, at the eye of, eye of, the, uh, of the storm. Um, a very interesting account um, of your own life as well as uh, hers. How long did she operate without being caught? 14 years. How come? Look, everything that I'm saying is in retrospect because I was very young. With the years, I, I knew things and I discovered things. Here in Israel, they opened some files intelligence files. And I found out, you know, what they, what she did. So I learned from all these things. She was very clever. She had a, a very high sense of intuition. So she remained a little bit far away from any danger, and but she knew how to work with people without being involved that in case that something will happen, she will not be caught. But finally, and this is the real story is that the Lebanese intelligence at the Desian Bureau, together with the Syrians, they penetrated the, uh, uh, the people. And this is how she was caught when one was penetrated to this group. Not an Israeli, but it was a cell, uh, one of whose members uh, became a double agent. Some, or at least came under suspicion. No, not of the same cell, but he joined the cell apparently after that he was pushed by the Lebanese and the Syrian intelligence to penetrate this uh, organization. So for 14 years, she managed to send information. 14 years. Yes. She was tasked by Israeli intelligence. Uh, she was asked to, to find certain developments. Yes, you know, at that time, don't forget that we had... Uh, historically speaking, you know, the union between Egypt and Syria. It was very important, you know, to know what's going on. And 1958, how, a very dangerous yes, year. Yes. Uh, it was a long, you know, a coup d'etat every, I don't know, single day or every month, you know, in Syria. And somebody new came. Uh, one, you know, wanted to do peace with, uh, with Israel. The other one wanted to fight Israel. So it was important to reach all kind of information. In Lebanon also, you know, I always thought that in Lebanon, Beirut, it's like in the Vatican. You have a lot of diplomats, you had a lot of information. So if you would like to gather some information, Beirut is the, the place, you know, of the old of the, the whole the Middle East. The stock exchange of information. Of the whole Middle East. You know, this is the place where you can, you know, uh, go around and, you know, uh, meet people, etc. Always you can come back with some new information. And she did it together with uh, sending young people um, coming from Syria and from Lebanon uh, to Israel as, you know, a new immigrant to come to Israel. But they smuggled the, 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 the border. How come uh, she and, and later you... Um, uh, came to know the Jumails, the uh, Camille Shamoun, who was the president until 1958 uh, and uh, the American invasion. Um, how come uh, you were uh, uh, traveling in this society? I will tell you uh, the story that I uh, put it in my book and the censorship, you know, agree for that. Uh, Camille Shamoun, Camille Shamoun, was a member of the parliament in Lebanon, and she succeeded, you know, to be in touch with him. One day, when I was in Boston, the consul general, I invited uh, the representative of the Haaris newspaper, uh, who came to Harvard uh, to study for a, a you know, few, few weeks. And suddenly, when we, you know, we stayed together, all the Israelis, they say, look, I have a story. Uh, one day, my boss, because I worked with the intelligence, he said, look, come with me. I would like that you will meet a very nice lady. And uh, because she is bringing with her somebody who might be the president of the Lebanese, uh, of, of Lebanon. And I went and I saw a lady. She make, I mean, she impressed me in a way that I say, look, I never saw such kind of things. And next to her, it was this member of the parliament. This member of the parliament, Camille Shamon, became the president of Lebanon. In 1952. 52, and this is how we know he fought with Nasser and you know the first civil war in Lebanon. 
The second story, and here again, I put it in, in my book, and I'm not divulging you know, any secret. Please do divulge some secret. <laughs> when she was in prison, she was maltreated by the people, the local people. Uh, because you are a spy, because you are a Jew, etc. So she asked me to do something with the Minister of Interior. Pierre Jumail. And Pierre Jumail was the, the, I pick up the phone and I call him. And he came to the prison. And he asked, where is Shula? Where is Shulamit? And this is how we, we, we succeeded to change the treatment. Uh, and she was very happy. And this is how we, we came to know, you know, the Jumail family. And you knew Bashir and Amin when they were uh, younger? Amin, yes. Bashir, no. Amin, yes, when he became president. Uh, I was indirectly in touch with him when I met him once in Quebec City. I was furious against him, but, you know, this is a different story. Uh, yes, uh, Pierre Jumail, yes, because, you know, I had to go and to explain exactly what my mother asked, um, you know, that they will alleviate a little bit, you know, the treatment because she, they, they behave, you know, really very, very harshly with her. Uh, but Bashir, no. But later, or perhaps earlier, uh, when we talk about it, uh, when there was a debate in the Israeli government whether to support Bashir Jumail for president in 1982, you said, no, the elder Jumail, Pierre, would be better. No. I say uh, uh, Bashir Jumail, uh, no, sorry. I say Amin Jumail, no. After they killed, you know, Bashir. After it. They wanted that his uh, uh, brother, Amin, will be the president or Kamil Shamoun. The, uh, Amin Jumail, the elder but weaker yes. brother. I was in favor of Kamil Shamon. I said, Don Miluk, he is an old guy. He's 80 years old. I said, who cares? It's, because, the, it's the family. It's, it's the mechanism. No, because not only the family, because here, you know, it's important to explain, you know, to the people. We were very close to a peace treaty with Lebanon. After that, we signed the agreement. It goes through the parliament and the, 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 the parliament approve it. So the only thing left was that the president will ratify it. It is technical things. So I believe that Kamil Shamoun, with whom we had you no know, contact, he will do it. I mean, you might, will not. And this is what happened. Because the threat of assassination by the Syrians would deter Amin, but not the old Kamil Shamoun. Kamil Shamoun didn't care about his longevity. Look, this is the difference between a leader and a non-leader. Amin was not a leader. Kamil Shamon was a leader. And I think, I believe, strongly believe, that he would have done it. Because this is a technical thing, the ratification after the, the parliament. And in the parliament, you have Christians, and you have Muslims, and you have those, and you have everybody. And they ratify, you know, they approve the, the agreement. So we were very close. It was, I mean, there is Jumail who blew up everything. Uh, we talk about the Jumails and the Shamuns as if um, these are very friendly clans. But in fact, uh, they were fighting each other, not only the Muslims. And Bashir Jumail ordered the killing of some of the Shamuns. Yes, not only the Shamuns. It was all of the Fangir also. It was, let's say, a war between the Christian camps. Uh, and it was a mistake. When I was um, in the foreign ministry and I wrote a paper about this, I said that this li mutual liquidation, physical liquidation, uh, that will bring the uh, Christian camp into a failure. And this is what happened. And this is how in Lebanon we see other community jumping in favor of the Christians who were dominating, who were, you know, by the way, the strongest community in Lebanon, not anymore. We have now the Shiite, and you have Hezbollah, and you have the others. It was of the ego and the mistakes done within the Christian camp. It was a self-destruct by the Maronites, who were sure that they were destined... They're all to, Maronites, by the way. Yes, that, that they were destined to rule, and the only question is who among them will be the ruler? You know, you are taking me in, um, in the year 1920, where the big mistake was done by the French... And by the Christian community, they wanted to enlarge or to extend, let's say, the territory of Lebanon up north and in the south. 
not taking into account that there is different communities in this part. And this is how the whole thing changed. Are you indicating that there is a lesson here for another nation overextending itself, occupying more territory, but bringing under its control a hostile population? You want to be? You want me to be con- candidly? Yes, please. Yes. So Israel should have uh, uh, learned. Uh, and by the way, in the in the nineteen fifties, there is a famous debate between uh, Foreign Minister and for a time Prime Minister Moshe Sharet and David Ben Gurion regarding the ability of Israel to hire some Maronite officer and therefore take Lebanon out of war. And Sharet, uh, who knew the Middle East, said, it's impossible. It's not going to work. Well, look, the discussion or the fight between Sharet and Ben-Gurion is uh, written, you know, in several books. I think that in retrospect, again, you know, looking back in the, you know, in, in the past, I think that Sharet was right. But uh, Ben-Gurion has to face a certain situation called the security situation. And this is very important for the sake and the future of a country. So, um, Yitzhak Lebanon, uh, Isaac uh, Cohen, um, you were uh, the, the son and, and the main uh, force uh, behind the efforts to release uh, Shula Cohen out of uh, Lebanese uh, prison. And um, it only succeeded after the 1967 uh, war as part of a prisoner exchange when Mossad insisted that she um, be a part of that. There were others in the military who said, well, she is not a a military uh, uh, woman. Uh, We should only focus on soldiers for soldiers. And we will get to that in the second part of our conversation coming very soon. You have it in my book. And we have it in your book, uh, uh, In the Eye of the Storm. Um, We will meet again. Uh, Thank you for the time being, Ambassador Lebanon. And we will be back for a second part of our conversation. In the meantime, shalom from Jerusalem.